stone. Jai Radha Madhava Kunjakti Hari Raya Hidhar Radha Madhava Kunjakti Hari Raya Gopi Janna Vallabha Kirivara Tahari Haya Gopi Janna Vallabha Gopi Janna Vallabha Kirivara Tahari Haya Gopi Janna Sodanandana Bhaja Janaranja Dhyas Jasodanandana Bhaja Janaranja Dhyas Jamuna Tira Hayan Chahan Jamun Tira Havana Chahi Amun Tira Hear her on Hiya Gopi Janavan Giri Haradha Hiya Giri Haradha Hiya Haradha Hiya Haradha Hiya Haradha Hiya Haradha Jasodanandana Hid her Hear it is so dhanna braja dhanahanja. Sixth chapter, verse number five. It is so dhanna braja dhanahanja. Jambu natira hai vanit 
जमून थेड़ा है बार भाम कुंज बिहार भाम कुंज बिहार So devotees have requested, I'm not sure which devotees, but devotees have requested, uh, we do a series of talks on the mind, so we'll take the verses from the Gita. 6.5 is the first verse. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if I had a Gita. <laughs> I know the translation, but not the uh, Sanskrit. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So, sixth chapter, Dandiana Yoga, chapter, verse number five. Urare Ratmanatmanam Natmanam Avasarayat Amaivo Yatmanam Bandur Amaivo Repo Atmanaha Udare Ratman Atman Hum Natmanam Avasadayat Atmaiva Yatman Hu Bandur Amaiva Repo Atmanaha Udare Ratman Atman Hum Natmanam Avasadayat Amaivo Yatmano Bandur Admaivo Ripur Atmanaha Udaret, one must deliver, Atmana, by the mind, Atmanam, the conditioned soul, Na, never, Atmanam, the conditioned soul, Avasadayet, put into degradation, Atma, mind, Eva, Certainly, he, indeed, Atmanaha, of the condition sold, Bandhu, friend, Atma, mind, Eva, 
certainly. Ripu, enemy, atmanaha, of the conditioned soul. Translation. One must deliver himself with the help of the mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada's purport. The word atma denotes body, mind, and soul depending on the different circumstances. In the yoga system, the mind and the conditioned soul are especially important. Since the mind is the central point of yoga practice, Atma refers here to the mind. The purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachments to sense objects. It is stressed herein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mire of nations. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because the mind is involved with the false ego, which desires to lord it over material nature. Therefore, the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter of the material nature, and in this way the conditioned soul may be saved. One should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects. The more one is attracted by sense objects, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. The word he is used for emphasizing this point. That is, that one must do this. It is also says, mana eva manushanam karanam banda moksayaho bandaya visasya sango Muktyai nirvavi sayam manaha. For man, mind is the cause of bondage and mind is the cause of liberation. Mind absorbed in sense objects is the cause of bondage and mind detached from sense objects is the cause of liberation. At Amritu Bindu Upanishad, number two. Therefore, the mind which is always engaged in Krishna consciousness is the cause of the supreme liberation. Umagyan timirandasya gina jana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya manobistam stapti tam yena bhutale svayam rupa kidam mayam dadati svam padantikam ma om vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shimakti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine namaste saraswati deve gauravani pracharine nirvishesha sunyavadi pasyatya de sutarine pancha kalpa teru vishya kripa sindhu pe bacha patitanam bhavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So this verse makes everything clear the difference between uh, entanglement in material life and freedom from that entanglement it's the mind the mind is the central principle of existence and the mind drags one according to where the mind goes. One means that it drags you, the soul. And using the senses, together the mind goes to sense objects. And Because sense objects are more powerful than the senses, but the mind is more powerful than sense objects. So senses are naturally drawn to sense objects where... By using the mind, one can withdraw the senses from sense objects and direct the mind in a way that is beneficial. Higher than the mind is the intelligence which guides the mind. And well, when the intelligence is of the same nature of the conditioned mind, then do you have what is called a reinforced enemy. That enemy is even stronger because the intelligence is uh, is, the, is the savior where the mind will act according to the principle of uh, thinking, feeling, and willing. The mind, the intelligence, is the discriminating factor of the mind. 
to choose where to apply the mind like that. But intelligence has to be purified through Shastric knowledge and through hearing from spiritual master. When that, when that purified consciousness develops, at least to some degree, then the intelligence can direct the mind away from sense objects and the senses can be geared into the service of the Lord. So, but the mind is chanchala. In the very end of this chapter, chanchala himana krishna, pramati balabhadriha, tasyaham nigamam yamanye vayur idam suduskaram. Um, when Krishna speaks this chapter, he's talking a lot through the whole chapter because this is dhyana. Dhyana means meditation yoga. And the principle of meditation is using the mind. So after giving much instructions on the mind and how it works and how it should be used, Arjuna uh, really comes up with a really defiant type of question, or maybe he can say challenging question. He says, you're asking me to control the mind, Lord, but I think you're asking me to control the wind. <laughs> Because the mind is stubborn, uh, uh, obstinate, uh, unsteady, uh, it can never be, the mind is always moving. It doesn't stay in one place. Meditation means to keep the mind on one particular object. When the emotional principle of the living entity is attached to the mind and the mind directs it towards a particular object, then the mind can stay on that object for some time. <laughs> Otherwise, the mind is always moving. It's constantly moving. Just like you see when you try to chant japa. You'll, you'll hear the, man, the mantra for, a little, for maybe one or two mantras, and then pretty soon it's somewhere else, right? You bring it back, and then there it is again, going away. It's, it's constantly moving. That's the nature of the mind. It's, uh, it has that tendency. That's why it's called chanchala. Chanchala refers to, also it refers to a lady who can't be stable in anything she does. But it, it also refers to the nature of the material energy, which is always moving and changing, and the mind is directed or connected to that mat moving material energy, and therefore it's full of thoughts, desires, emotions, uh, some good, some not good. <clears throat> So to control the mind means to direct the mind in the right way. <clears throat> but then who is doing the direction? You, the soul, using the intelligence like that. So therefore, one has to be always conscious of the nature of where your mind is at every moment and not allow the mind to somehow just walk you through life because it'll do that. If you're not conscious of where it's taking you, you'll also be dragged through places you really don't, shouldn't go at all. <laughs> That's the nature of the mind. So uh, one has to, uh, we'll speak a little bit in, in some of the upcoming classes about how the mind works in relationship to the soul. But here we just want to get to the basic principles where it says that <clears throat> you have your best friend and your worst enemy right next to you. In fact, when Prahlad Maharaj was... Uh, challenged by his father, Hiranyakashi Pu, when Prahlad was preaching to his father in Krishna consciousness, Hiranyakashi Pu became quite en en angry and said, you are siding with my enemy, Vishnu. Vishnu is my enemy. But Prahlad responded, my dear father, your only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> because friends and enemies are made by the mind. Sometimes you see how the mind changes. Sometimes you have a lot of attraction and affection for a person and then the next day it's something completely different. We have, we have different feelings from the same objects at different circumstances. So you see how the mind is always moving and it's affected by the three modes of material nature. Especially good, uh, rajas and tamas. The mind is in goodness. At least it has, at least it's directed in in the right way. And then from there, you, one can move the mind to the process of pure devotional service. But one has. Well, we'll get into the workings of the mind, how the mind actually works, 
because it's a very complex system. The mind that we have now, that we're working with at the present life, is something we've been with for many millions of lives. It's not like you get a new mind every time you get a new physical body. The, the only thing new is your physical body, your subtle body stays the same life after life after life. And it's that subtle body that takes the soul from the present body to the next body by the direction of the mind at the time of death. Yam yam vapi sparam bhavam taktva ante kalevaram tam tam ivaiti konteya sadata bhava bhavitaha so yeah so at the life is really about accumulating enough krishna conscious uh, uh, thought process where we can meditate on krishna at the time of death and then ultimately attain the lotus feet of the lord free from the cycle of birth and death so this um we one thing we can learn from this particular verse there's no there's no other enemy except our mind just like I give you an example of how the mind works um, you're on top of a building and it's a high building and you look down the mind says jump the intelligence says no mm -hmm. and you can see one is speaking one way one is speaking the other way the intelligence is your saving factor your mind if it doesn't have any intelligence one may even listen to the mind and do the most craziest things. So therefore, one has to strengthen the intelligence and that will harness the mind in the right direction in Krishna consciousness. Another example of how the mind works is that you're in your house and you're, you know what your house is like, you know everything about your house, and then all the lights are out and it's completely dark and you get scared. <laughs> Nothing changes. The atmosphere is the same except now you can't see anything and then the mind starts to access the principle of fear so it creates this illusion of fear although there is no reason to be fearful except for the fact that now you can't see the environment but you know you're in your environment and it's always been like that and within one second everything changes and now you feel this fearfulness so you see how the mind can fool you into different situations. And therefore Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, uh, the mind is a non-devotee. <laughs> He's a non-devotee. And therefore you have to make your mind your, a devotee because we're not supposed to associate with non-devotees, right? So. So remember that principle, and that way you can always see. Therefore, a devotee, it says a yogi especially, but a devotee also watches his mind and seeing where the mind is going. But better than watching it is keeping it directed in the right way. And that takes practice like that. Sometimes we, we are able to direct our mind very nicely during the day, but at night when we sleep, we find we, the mind goes to different places that we don't even know anything about um, just like sometimes uh, all of a sudden you're in a, a completely different atmosphere when you're in the sleep state and you see beings in, in, in that dream state that you don't even recognize and you're acting in a completely different way or in a way that is contrary to what you would normally act and then well these where is this coming from it's coming from the subtle part of the mind which brings up impressions and experiences that happen during the waking hours and sometimes throws it all together and comes out into a different pattern that makes no sense or has no you have it has no connection with anything that you know it's like some different reality you're now in but none of these things that you experience in the dream has not happened to you in one sense in the sense that the objects, as they play themselves out, maybe are the same, but the way it plays itself out is completely different. And Prabhupada gives the example. He said, you see a mountain, and then you see gold. And then in, in your dream, you see a golden mountain. 
So you know gold, you know mountain, but the dream state throws these together into a different different structure, and there you're experiencing something different. That's why it seems a lot of dreams have no sense at all. But other dreams are impressions of desires. Sometimes in devotees, uh, it says for devotees who have material desires, sometimes they get rid of material desires in dreams by fulfilling those desires in the dream. And that also can happen like that. So, therefore, the mind is very powerful, <laughs> extremely powerful, and it can drag one to different places. Therefore, one should be very, the word diligent, is, I think, is the word that applies. Diligent means constantly uh, aware of the, in the workings of the mind and where it's going and how to keep it directed like that. And therefore, one should watch the mind just like one watches Prabhupada gives the example in his lecture on the mind. Just like one may have a wife that's a, that's a prostitute. Now, the prostitute wife sometimes will go out and have an affair with another man. And sometimes that man will develop attachment to that prostitute. And then that man will kill the husband for the sake of the prostitute wife. So in the same way, Prabhupada uses that example. Just like one has a prostitute wife, he should never trust her. In the same way, we should never trust the mind. Because the, the uncontrolled mind can kill the yogi. And the example is Subari Muni. Subari Muni was a great Muni when he was meditating underwater. But simply by seeing two fishes copulating together, he became somewhat bewildered by that. And uh, he became attracted to that, and then he left his whole meditation process and took up the uh, activities of household life. Mm -hmm. uh, so Prabhupada also uses the example of Lord Shiva, which is a little different, how the Mohini Murti feature of the Lord attracted uh, Lord Shiva. And although Lord Shiva is Dira, he's a personification of Dira, still, it shows that now Prabhupada said Shiva is all right, but these great souls are also teaching us that even I can be bewildered, be bewildered, what to speak of you. So one of the things that a devotee should always remember, never think yourself safe. Oh, I've made enough advancement where I'm fixed and now I'm safe and everything is okay. No. Um, this this uh, this wrong mentality causes you to become less dependent on the Lord's mercy, and therefore you become vulnerable to the actions of the material energy, and one can be easily trapped by these ag activities. Therefore, one should always be careful to direct the mind in the process of devotional service. And one of the great benedictions that we have in our process of devotional service is the Holy Name is always available. We don't have to have our bead bags. We can chant Hare Krishna anytime, anywhere, any place, at any time, in any situation. And that will uh, immediately bring us back to the spiritual realm like that. So one should always remember that, that if the mind goes off, and sometimes you feel like it's really going off, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> That'll bring it back. Like that. And, but don't listen to your mind because the, your mind is not you. You have to understand that you are different than the mind. It's a tool that you use to experience the outer world and bring the inner world to the outer world. In other words, whatever's inside comes out through the mind, whatever's outside comes in through the mind. So the mind is like a, a medium for the external activities and the internal activities of the soul. Like that. Okay, so yeah, the mind is very uh, tricky. <laughs> it can trick you at every any minute, like that. And there are many examples. Uh, of course, the examples given by the great souls who are controllers are simply messages for us to teach us that never think yourself so good that you are above 
being attracted by the material energy. Because you may think, oh, yeah, I'm pretty much fixed in Krishna consciousness, nothing can attract me. As soon as you say that, you're on your way down. <laughs> now, the material energy is very powerful, and Krishna can arrange the material energy in such a way that there will be an attraction for you you can't resist. <laughs> You'll be overwhelmed, and you'll be bewildered, and you'll be uh, active <laughs> in your... So we never never think that we are safe or strong enough to withstand the, the allurements of the material energy. That's why one has to be very careful to control the mind and senses like that. And as Prabhupada ends from this verse from the Amrita Bindu Upanishads, which is one of the Upa Upanishads. There are 12 principal Upanishads. There are 108 Upanishads. And, uh, outside of the 12 principal Upanishads, the other ones are called Upa, or smaller. This one is from the Amrita Bindu Upanishad. It says, for man, mind is the cause of bondage, and mind is the cause of liberation. Yeah. So, um, mind absorbed in sense objects. If you find yourself dwelling on sense objects and you know you're, you're, you're bringing this uh, process of fall down into, the, into action. Because the meditating on sense objects means gradually you become attracted to them. If you can't fulfill those objects in your mind, therefore lust develops. And from lust, anger. Frustration of desire brings anger. And from anger brings delusion. When then from delusion, memory is bewildered, and when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. As soon as your memory gets bewildered, your intelligence is gone, and then you're on your way down. And then, and then the last word is vinashati, means you fall down. So one should be very careful to keep the mind always in the right state. And we'll talk about some of the things you can do to keep the mind from going in the wrong direction. And we'll give you a little understanding of how the mind works in relationship to the soul. Because a lot of times we don't see the distinction between myself and my mind. We identify ourselves with the mind. And we have to remember we are not the mind and not the thoughts of the mind either, which are the activities of the mind. These are something that has come by way of our conditioned nature. Even our spiritual thoughts are brought into us through, through different energies. Um, but the mind is processing that. So of course, when the mind becomes completely purified, then the material mind disappears and the spiritual mind is revealed. Because there's no such thing as the material mind. It's simply a covering over the spiritual mind. You only have one mind. But this is a shadow mind that we've created in association with the material energy. It's not real, but it's powerful. <laughs> it's interesting how it is. Out of all of the illusionary concepts that make up the material energy, the mind is the most powerful. <laughs> and we see how people do the most craziest things just because of what happens in the mind. <laughs> And the mind, we, we see sometimes people act even outside of normal material behavior. And, because, and they actually justify that by the activities, by, by the a philosophy of, of justifying whatever happens is a, actually okay. So the mind will not only drag you away, but it will convince you that it, this is the best thing for you. <laughs> Just like I give you one example. Sometimes a person will think, well, you know, I can be better off making spiritual advancement in, outside of the association of devotees. And I can make my own arrangements and I can organize my life even better. But then this is just a trick of the mind just to get you, to, to throw you out of the association. And then you can actually convince yourself that devotee association is not important. And that happens a lot. So then the mind can come up with so many wrong ideas which are contrary to the soul's benefit and convince the, uh, 
the soul or the intelligence that this is the actual, you know, reality or truth like that. Okay, so we'll all stop here and see if there's any discussion on the mind. And please use your mind to talk. <laughs> Hare Krishna, thank you. Uh, I wonder about these mind impressions, like if you if you got some negative impressions, like if you are uh, yeah. uh, not discouraged, like uh, disappointed, disappointed, and usually when you have some disappointment in your life, there are uh, d some negative impressions, like feelings behind. Right. And then, like by working on by Krishna's mercy these emotions can be dissolved. So I understand this like an artist. But at the end, even though these emotions can be dissolved, these impressions are still there. So yeah, this but is normal that these impressions, like you were describing last time, that you still remember some things like yeah. flashes. Well, these, the, these impressions, as long as the emotions are gone, the impressions are not being fed anymore. So then, therefore, in due course of time, those impressions will also leave if they're replaced with positive Krishna conscious thought process like that. I mean, you don't want to remember a lot of the things you did in the past. And a lot of times you can't remember because you now you're more connected to a higher consciousness. But sometimes, you know, if you really try, you can remember some of the things that disappointed you or frustrated you or defeated you earlier in your life, but now they're gone because your energy is directed. So as long as the emotional principle is gone, there's no feeding of the that uh, impression. So that's what feeds it, the emotions, yeah. yeah. When there are still emotions, it's hard to control. But when those emotions are dissolved, you can control somehow. But even though I wonder how some impressions after so many years are still coming, even though there are no feelings. And some are coming pretty much frequent. Like If they're coming, that means there's some emotional connection there. Otherwise, they wouldn't be coming. If you can look at them in a neutral sense, then it's simply the mind just flashing on that, and it has no it that has no effect on you then. Yeah. Otherwise, if they're if they're coming and they're making you feel either happy or sad, that means the emotional uh, process is still working. Again, all these things must be replaced with higher consciousness, Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when Krishna consciousness develops, it becomes stronger and pushes these things out. Mm -hmm. Because they're just clouds, just like, you know, they have no reality. They're just clouds in, an, in, in the experiences of our life, that's all. But the thing is, when they come, don't, don't think of them. Just immediately throw them out. If they happen to come and there's some emotion there, just realize, well, if I meditate on them or think about them or analyze them, even analyzing them, they're going to get stronger. And that's true. Just like they say that there are people in the world who are out to rid the world of evil. They're called do-gooders and they want to make everything nice. But they focus on all the wrong things to destroy it. And because they focus on these wrong things, they also become affected by them. In the same way. Mm -hmm. So therefore, just push it out completely. And replace it with something Krishna conscious, that's all. And by doing this, after some time they won't come anymore. But as soon as you give it some thought, then you're feeding it. Yeah. Yeah, our life goes like that. Now we're moving 
and pretty soon you'll become purified from all these things and you'll your mind will be fixed on higher consciousness and that'll come but you have to work towards that and part of the working is to uh, remove those things that come into the mind that are not favorable to our Krishna consciousness Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you for these uh, nice topics. Uh, I have few answers, uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> and uh, in some of them you already answered, I think. Uh, does unfulfilled desires also follow from previous lives? Yeah. So if those desires are often also unknown to me now or well they may take another form but they're still there yeah unfulfilled desires carry you from life life after life yeah, yeah that's what brings you to the next situation you get a body that is meant to fulfill those unfulfilled desires because Krishna will help you fulfill your desires by giving the, you the opportunity in terms of the facility to fulfill it like that. Uh, what to do as soon as mind serve us some thoughts that is no benefit for spiritual progress? Kick it out. Okay. <laughs> when I was a bhakta, I used to have this bhakta leader. I don't want to do it the way he did it because I don't want to scare everyone, but... He would say, kill that thought or it'll kill you. And he would say it with such vocal that I would shake. Uh, okay, you're right. <laughs> kill that thought or it'll kill you. And he was right. <laughs> One of those Vedic aphorisms. So yeah, don't dwell on these things. Just brain. You have a choice. You don't have a choice what comes into the mind, but once it does, then you have a choice either to focus on it or throw it out. A lot of times what comes into the mind is part of the atmosphere. If you go into a place that is full of sinful activities, you're going to feel it. <laughs> and you're also... Maybe you might also pick up impressions from that atmosphere. And then that will carry with you. You go into a temple, your, your mind changes by the atmosphere. So even the external environment can in, will influence, not can, will influence thoughts within your mind. That's why you should always keep an environment that is... Uh, somewhat sattvic, just like I always complain when I first came to here and back in June that apartment I had was who like I wanted to get out of there fast <laughs> my mind kept saying you can't stay here this this place has just got too much bad energy <laughs> and it did but somehow or other I called in help in the form of Ananda Vardhana and his great wife. And they said, this place is a vastu. <laughs> Let's change it all around. So they kept giving me swat stickers and relocating places. And then, of course, I set up my deities and I chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so gradually, it's, it's, it's changed now. It's not like that anymore. I mean, I, I could feel it so strongly that when I got there, I just wanted to leave. It was just like, I can't stay here. i got to get out of here. <laughs> that, was, that was my feeling. It was obvious. It wasn't, it wasn't so many bad thoughts. It was just the, the whole atmosphere had negativity. You could feel it. It was just like, just negative. And it became hard to chant, too, because of that negativity. Uh, so yeah, so even external uh, energy can influence how in your thought process. Uh, sometimes uh, mind uh, 
keep serving us the same thoughts, uh, even though I'm thinking uh, arguments why not and resisting. And uh, I think this is also the problem, this dwelling, but how to... Well, sometimes some of the, if these thoughts are in relationship to Krishna consciousness, then Krishna is also saying this is... Maya is also showing you what you need to work on. Sometimes you get the repeated thoughts because this is, this is one of your anarthas or this is one of your material desires. So it's something you have to... You see it, oh, okay, I got to get rid of this. Especially if you do the same thing each day, just like devotees sometimes say, boy, the same thing has happened to me every day. I'm saying, well, I said, the question is, you're doing the same thing, you'll get the same results. <laughs> Change the way you think and the activity and you'll get a different result. Mm -hmm. The last one. Uh, what is the cause of intelligence that gives up to the dictation of the mind? What is the cause of the intelligence that says, surrenders to the mind? Yeah, yeah. The mind becomes more powerful than the intelligence. The mind is in the mode of goodness, the intelligence is in the mode of passion. <laughs> and the false ego is in the mode of ign ignorance, the three parts of our subtle body, like that, in their pure state, like that. So, um, sometimes the mind just becomes more powerful than the intelligence, that's all. And dictates to the intelligence. Sometimes the intelligence is more powerful. But if the intelligence is, is also part of the conditioned, our conditioned nature, we can't take advice from the intelligence. We have to replace that by what is called Shastra Shakshus. You have to apply your intelligence that you get from Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, and use that intelligence as your as your directing force in life, and not your simply your mind like that. When you get to the certain stage of practicing Krishna consciousness, then you know how to use your intelligence. And you're, then you, you can keep your intelligence active and it'll always be directing, you in the, directing your mind in the right way. But until you get to purified intelligence, you have to take that intelligence that is purified coming from the external environment, such as Guru, Shadow, and Shastra. I see, am I seeing you? No, I'm seeing your body. But I know you're different than your body. That's, that's intelligence. If I see you as I see, I, I'm seeing with my eyes, and then I'm seeing wrongly. <clears throat> so, Maharaj, is it this? If we cultivate mode of goodness, is it? It's, this goes ha um, also with the mind control, or or do we have to do it both? So we have to control our mind and at the same time, cultivate mode of goodness? Well, cultivating the mode of goodness means the qualities of the mode of goodness. So in order to do that, you have to, you have to cultivate those qualities by using the mind. Mm -hmm. The mind is the source of how you cultivate those qualities, which bring you to the mode of goodness. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not going to, cultivation means active mental, uh, an active mental state, that's all. I want to be humble, so what do I have to do to become humble? So then you have to cultivate the mood of humility by using your intelligence and the mind together. Like that. You, the soul, is directing it through using these um, agencies. So the mind, the intelligence, and the senses are also part of the spiritual body in the purified state. So we want to access those, those elements of our existence that are spiritual and not the material aspect of them, that's all. 
So when you take directions from higher authority or spiritual authority, you're acting on the spiritual platform. So in the beginning of our process, we take directions from Guru, Shadow and Shastra. As we become more advanced, then we get more directions from Super Soul directly. Because the Super Soul is the manifestation, the Guru is the manifestation of the Super Soul, that's all. There's no difference between Guru and Super Soul, they're the same. So cultivation means using the understanding the principles that you want to cultivate and using your mind to bring them about, that's all. Mm -hmm. And that's Krishna consciousness. Yeah. There's three ways you can control the mind. And I was, wasn't going to bring it up tonight, but I thought I just might as well just mention it. Three ways to control the mind. One, engage it fully in devotional service. Jai Sisi Panchatattva Ki Jai. One, to engage it in devotional service. Two, to meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master constantly. And three, and this is a little lesser, but it has an effect, work for the welfare of others. When you're always trying to do good to others, that way, that's one way to control the mind. <laughs> so these three principles are, uh, are the ways to direct the mind in the right way. Absorb yourself in the activities of devotional service, meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master constantly, and or work for the welfare of others. Three recommended ways to keep the mind controlled. <laughs> okay, so I think we can stop here. We'll continue this subject tomorrow and we'll get into a little bit more of the complex nature of the mind in relationship to the rest of the, the uh, living entity's existence. Okay. Because it's a very, this mind guy is really, he's not an easy guy to deal with. <laughs> he's a mystery. <laughs> okay. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shumar Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.